in accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we're conducting this meeting in a hybrid model, both in person and virtually. The Public Works Commission is conducting this meeting June 8th, 2022, 4 p.m. Eastern time on the Zoom platform and in person in accordance with the town's policy directive and guidelines issued on April 1st, 2020 and amended on May 7th. I ask that all Public Works Commissioners, town staff, and presenters activate their video and mute their microphone unless they have something to say or are participating in committee dialogue. We love your dog, but we don't need to hear him during the meeting. For members of the public, when I open the meeting for, to public comment in order to be recognized, please use the raise hand option in Zoom or star nine by phone. If you are recognized, please state your name and address this meeting is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on the town's website. I, David DeLong, hereby call this meeting to order. All commission votes will be taken by a roll call. We will start with an attendance roll call of commissioners. When announce your name, please reply and state whether you are attending in person or remotely. Andrew Solomon. Here in person. James Terry. Present here. Jeff Basser. Here in person. And Dave DeLong here in person. Yes. I'm going to start by reviewing and approving the minutes um, for, May, for the May 11th, 2022 Public Works Commission meeting. Are there any comments from the commissioners? No. No comments? I move that we approve the minutes of May 11th, 2022. Can I have a second? Second. Second. Roll call for approval. Andrea Solomon. Aye. James Terry. Aye. Jeff Basser. Aye. David DeLong. Aye. Jeff, we're good. I mean, sir. we're going to review the calendar for proposed meeting dates. Yep. Okay. So um, I have to say that uh, I've been advertising for some of the new uh, commission members that sometimes we take the summer off when we can. Uh, just a couple months. Um, this year, there's a few things that are brewing that may or may not allow us to do this. But so uh, we've identified the dates so that it's on your calendar. Uh, and we'll confirm as soon as there is a need or if there's a need to meet. Uh, but it will be driven by sort of an issue, um, not just a general sort of meeting. Um, with that said, uh, so we have kind of listed it um, July 13th, tentative same time, same location, as well as August 10th tentative. Um, I don't anticipate both, but I will say that um, there may be some time sensitive issues. Uh, one of them may be uh, scenic roads, uh, regulations, you know, we're trying to partner and coordinate. We got notice this week of an interest on coordination with Public Works Commission and Planning Board. That was for early August. The request just came in yesterday, so I didn't have a chance to really review it and see if we can even meet that deadline, but that's on our, our radar, uh, for instance. So other than that, uh, we also have, you know, preparation for the special town meeting uh, in September, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that, but that'll be sort of a, a significant initiative. And with those dates again were July 13th and August 10th? Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Anything else? So that's it. We're that's it as far as count. Okay. Yeah. We're going to move on to item two, which is the solid waste recycling sub and subscription hearing. Uh, I move that we uh, enter the, that we open the, the solid waste recycling subscription rate hearing. Okay. I'll get the roll call about opening the, meet, the hearing. Um, Andrew Solomon? Aye. James Terry? Aye. Jeff Basser? Yes. David DeLong? Yes. So it was. Um, yeah, you're going to have Aaron McCloskey uh, come up, Highway Ground Superintendent. And as we've talked a little bit about our, Aaron, we can come up here if you like. Um, and uh, as you know, with some of our reorganization and staff you know, transitions, uh, Aaron and his team have um, stepped up. And they're sort of taking the lead on, you know, the trash recycling. And he's got a, a brief presentation I'll bring up on the screen for you. And uh, let me just make sure that my uh, share features are 
working properly. And then we're near here. Second, zoom. This up a little bit again there. Here. I mean, it's hard to get good high tech out Yeah, yeah, no, I had this on. I'm just uh, I'm trying to share. I'm just trying to go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm you can start, start with this while, little I, little while I find it. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you all for the introduction. My name is Aaron McLaughlin, so high ground super tech. Um, so, as Alan stated, my team uh, took over an uh, interim role of. Uh, Managing the solid waste and recycling program uh, started uh, January of this year. Um, so, you know, set out by kind of trying to get up to speed with the program um, and uh, continue the management. And I pro did provide a memo um, through Alan to the to the um, to the commission. They kind of provided some detail uh, overview of the program. Um, you know how it's kind of been going, um, our plans for moving forward uh, next year, and. Some of the price proposals that we've received uh, with the contract that I'll kind of go into detail uh, here in a couple minutes as we, as we go through the slides. But, um, kind of a general overview of the program uh, in the past. So the town has had a, a contract with waste management, They're the, the contract and service provider that provides the municipal solid waste and recycling services to the town um, for residential as well as the municipal and school facilities. Uh, and uh, the contract's been in place with them since about 2004. Um, you know, there's been a number of contract amendments uh, since the original contract, um, and the current contract and amendment is set to. Can we just go back to the perfect? Thank you. Um, it's set to expire here um, at, in September. But I'll start with you know, the mission of the solid waste and recycling division is to provide a, an efficient, environmentally sound, and cost-effective solid waste collection disposal and recycling program to subscribers. Um, of the town's curbside program. A little bit of an overview of the program, what it provides. The town services provide a weekly collection uh, to all residents. It's a four day pickup for um, resident, residential locations. And then we have trucks in, in, in town up to five days a week, uh, providing downtown public barrel collection on Mondays um, and uh, throughout the week, uh, seasonally as needed, which we coordinate with directly to waste management. Um, it's a pay as you throw program. So subscribers sign up for the program, get you on the list, uh, and then you pay for, uh, depending on the amount of um, solid waste that you uh, dispose of weekly. So whether it's a bag or a barrel or multiple bags or multiple barrels, um, the more you throw away, the more you pay every week. Uh, we do provide dual stream recycling. So there's, there's a paper and cardboard collection, as well as a co-mingle that has a glass and metal and plastics. Um, that is picked up curbside as well on a weekly basis. Program has a household hazardous waste collection component where residents have the uh, option to drop off uh, multiple times throughout the year at public works facilities that has household hazardous waste um, for a fee that is included within the service. And then additional times, uh, there's additional fees associated with um, those drop offs. There's a town wide drop off recycling event that takes place twice a year. We host that here at this facility, often referred to as a drop off swap off event or a drop off no swap off, depending on, uh, depending on the year. Uh, and uh, there's also universal waste collection services that are provided by CPW staff, and that's, that's daily as offices are open. Um, we have a semi annual building, so subscribers, the residents can, can subscribe for a six month period of time. So if people are traveling, they're going to be out of town for an extended period of time. They don't have to pay for you know uh, extended services when they're not being utilized. And recently, uh, we've transferred over to a kind of an online payment system to allow, allow for additional um, customer service. So solid waste and recycling drop-off events. There's two, like I mentioned, there's one in the spring and one in the fall. Uh, we had this last one in May, are very well attended and, and received. Is a significant amount of effort that goes into coordinating those events. Um, one of the reasons why um, you know Alan thought it was best to 
uh, and I transfer it over at least temporarily to highway and grounds so we can oversee the operations. We're heavily involved in, in the events that take place at this campus. Obviously, if you were to drive around the campus on any other day, it's occupied by um, highway and grounds, water, sewer vehicles and equipment, and team, you know, teams are working out there daily. So we have to move all the equipment out of there ahead of each event, and then we'll go back and we're working during the event. So it makes sense to have it in the highway and grounds group. Um, we have another one scheduled in October of this year. And like I mentioned, you know, we have um, solid universal waste collection daily here, households hazardous waste. We have, uh, and residents can drop it off, the drop off swap up event days, or we have uh, kind of a, a, um, a, a municipal consortium, if you will, uh, agreement where we're part of the Minuteman Collection Group that we're able to go over to, the, to Lexington, residents go over to Lexington and drop off uh, hazardous waste um, on Saturdays throughout the year. That's scheduled posted on the town website. And we have a paint shed, so residents can dispose of the paint um, and down at the compost site uh, when, when that's open Wednesday evenings and Saturdays. Our compost site's located, located at 755 Walden Street, uh, staffed by Howie and Grounds uh, employees Wednesday evenings and Saturdays, um, seasonally, April through December, uh, where residents can drop off yard waste, you know, unlimited amounts, if you will, for residential, non commercial uses, and then pick up uh, processed compost. Um, that your waste is processed in a compost. We'll screen it, we'll turn it throughout the year, and then provide a, a quality compost material which residents can, can pick up and use. Um, and we also provide wood chips. That's kind of a, a byproduct of our tree maintenance program. Uh, so we have wood chips, uh, untreated uh, surplus available for residents to pick up as well. There. So, um, so a little bit about our dual stream solid our recycling program, commingled recycling. You can see the kind of there's two pie charts there that make up the uh, the, the uh, contents of those uh, those categories. The commingled majority is glass. You know we have the person paper recycling. The majority of that's mixed paper and cardboard. We do have a cardboard drop off facility located at this property. We have a number of dumpsters. Um, we're it's open 24/7, 365 for residents can utilize for excess cardboard. We do ask that residents don't drop off paper through there. It's labeled. Tonnage and recycling rates, uh, this graph shows uh, how we've been performing up through you know, last year. Uh, and we're currently at a 37% recycling rate, which means that of uh, what we dispose, 37% of it is recycled material. Um, and we have um, a really good recycling rate compared to other municipalities in the town. And you know, we had, even today, we had a meeting with Mass DEP um, to discuss some grant programs that we're planning for. You know, they, they look at our program as a um, kind of a top of the line um, program with a pay it pays these are all and everything that we do. Um, the involvement, obviously residents are very involved with the operations. They, you know, have, um, want to be as sustainable as possible, reducing our carbon footprint. We try to make sure that our uh, <coughs> operations align with that. So a little bit into the numbers and of our expenses and, and revenue, this chart shows our expenses. Um, these are projected expenses for FY23 budget because that's what we're here to talk about is the rate setting uh, for that. So as you can see, our curbside collection contract is the main driver. So that's what we pay waste management to come and collect trash recycling from uh, residents in town and municipal properties. Uh, there's a disposal fee. Um, so not only do we have to pay for the actual trucks, the labor to pick up the material, we have to pay to dispose of and process that material. There's a recycling processing fee as well. Uh, general fund services. So support services that, uh, that the town provides. This is an enterprise fund. So, you know, only um, the, the money's technically only spent on, um, you know, the things that, that support the, the, the operation and, and general fund services could be other things from other departments that, that we pay highway grounds to support or staffing, et cetera, to support. Personnel services, there are, uh, there's uh, two headcounts that are associated with this position. Um, uh, that's what fund salaries. Uh, purchase services, so different um, uh, contracted things, hazardous waste disposal, things of that nature. So materials <laughs> and supplies, trash bags, liners, dumpsters, barrels, and then other charges and expenses, miscellaneous, uh, totaling to 2 .2 million. So it's all the expenses for the Revenue sources, uh, you can see our revenue sources. You can see the bottom line still match up, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But the, the revenue sources, uh, Driven by subscription fees, so for collection, so that's the that's the annual fee. You can sign up for six months. Um, disposal fees, so that's the actual. So, so what what collection fees are subscription? That's the cost to have the truck drive down the street and somebody 
uh, operate those vehicles. So there's three trucks, there's one for the trash and three and two for recycling. Uh, disposal fees for the tag and the sticker, sticker that's paying for um, to have somebody pick up the trash and, and remove of it, and dispose of it and process it. Um, town facilities and public barrels. So there's a number of public barrels that are throughout town, uh, downtown Concord, the road depot area in West Concord. Uh, we put those out seasonally and a couple are left out throughout the year um, as well as town facilities. So that's like dumpsters at this building that we have here uh, for our operation and some other town buildings. Schools are charged separately in another category. We have a drop off day, those two events I spoke about earlier. Um, you can see the pretty expensive days here. There's quite a, if you've ever attended, there's a lot of operations that are involved. Um, business recycling program that we offer uh, seasonally to uh, assist the small businesses to come and recycle things like paper shredding or, or electronics disposal. We have compost bins that we provide to, uh, to residents. And then there's a the recycling bit as to the woods. Um, so total revenue just, just, uh, just over 1.9 million. So what this chart does is this, this is just showing um, and, and doing a comparison of our expenses versus the revenue, and then also showing um, you know what our net income is. And you can see here we're, you know, we're projecting a, a loss for FY23, but that's intentional because if you look at the, the far the bottom column, far right, uh, um, and it shows fund balance. So right now at the end of FY22, that's the fiscal year that we're currently in, and we're projecting a fund balance. So additional funds of can kind of think of a retained earnings, if you will, if you want to relate to, to, to water and sewer, uh, of $7,900,000. Uh, so quite a quite a large fund balance. Uh, and you can see it's been increasing over the last few years. Um, you know, we've had a, a healthy budget, a lot of uncertainty in the market, a lot of uncertainty with COVID, a lot of uncertainty. So we always kind of try to budget uh, um make sure that we can provide those services to customers. What we don't do, want to do is under budget and not be able to provide the services that are expected. So um, what we are anticipating this year is, and I'll present is, is a no rate increase, which is really, and with contracting costs going up, um, we're going to eat into that fund balance, which is you know what we're being told to do, what we should be doing, you know, keep that closer to zero. Um, and if, but still have some reserves in case something happens or if we want to make a major capital, you know, major change to the program in a future year, they, require significant capital investment. That's where that would come from. But really this year, um, we're going to be, you know, intentionally uh, kind of spending into that, into that fund balance. But at the end of the year, we're still having projected fund balance uh, of over $400,000. So for the rates, um, like I mentioned, we are projecting uh, and, and recommending a, a no rate increase from FY22 to FY23. You can see the last year the commission uh, voted in a rate increase. Um, and this year, you know, we're looking to, to keep it the same. Uh, collection fee of $322, disposal fee, the tag prices staying the same, $1.80 a tag uh, for a bag, uh, barrel sticker, $46.80 for each sticker, and the average cost um, with being for the resident. Uh, $449.30. And the way that we average it is we're, we're, we're estimating that residents put out either one, 1. 1.36 bags or barrels of trash at their curb per week. Obviously, some weeks generate more trash, like a holiday week or a party week uh, <laughs> at the house. Uh, and some weeks are less. It might be on vacation, might not put out anything. So, um, projected no rating. We're, we're recommending no rating increase for this year. Uh, so, every year we do solicit. Um, and reach out to some private haulers to see the price comparison to make sure that we're um, offering a competitive, cost-effective, uh, economical program to the residents of Concord. Uh, I don't list private hauler names, but we list them as one, two, and three. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, for the last few years, we've, we've been competitive um, with those private haulers. Some of the reasons you might ask why somebody would choose a private hauler versus uh, a municipal program, um, there's a lot of um, unique properties in Concord with uh, unique driveways mm -hmm. and uh, they aren't as accessible for uh, waste management as maybe a private hauler would be able to do. Private haulers may be able to offer smaller trucks or, uh, you know, extra people that can, you know, move and go onto the property strategically without doing any damage or anything like that. We offer a curbside pickup program where trash needs to be brought up by the curb um, every week in order for waste management to, to remove the trash. Um, some residents don't want to bring the trash up to the curb. Some might not 
be able to bring it out to the curb, whatever reason it might be, they might want to go for the private hauler and pay a little bit more for a more unique, customized, higher level service to do it. But we, we have uh, over 3,500 customers out of about 5,500 um, properties that we could, we could service a tenant. So a little bit about the contract. Um, so we are currently in a long-term contract, been in contract with Waste Management in Midtown since 2004. Uh, there's been a number of amendments and extensions. The most recent expires in September of 2022. Uh, moving forward, we've had a number of conversations, Alan and I, with Waste Management and uh, looking at what proposals, uh, they provide us with proposals, some options. Um, we are recommending uh, to the town manager bill, it's appropriate that we institute a, a two-year contract uh, with waste management so that we can continue to evaluate the program. Um, I attended the select board meeting on Monday uh, uh, Monday evening and, and informed them of, you know, of, of this plan as well. And really, you know, we had a, there was a, a resident survey that went out last year. We got a lot of great feedback from residents, um, heard what they, they, they liked about the program, heard some things that they'd like to see. You know, um, looking at the goals of the town, sustainability, um, reducing our impacts, um, and we're, we're, we really want to reevaluate uh, how we can best incorporate some uh, new services, um, some sustainable, sustainable initiatives. Some of those things include like automation, reducing our carbon footprint, um, expanding services, and enhanced opportunities at compost site. And what do those mean? So automation means. Just that kind of removing the, the human component right now. Uh, and op the operator has to get out of the truck, grab the trash barrel, dump the can into the into the truck, and then get back in the truck. Automation would mean that residents receive a cart that's on wheels. Uh, the truck is uh, built and equipped to pick up the cart uh, mechanically, dump it into the truck, drop it, and the truck driver keeps going. That reduces the impact on the driver. So obviously less risk of injury. Their insurance costs go down, their labor costs go down and provide a, and it's quicker, right? Um, reduce carbon footprint. Currently, we have three trucks that come to town every day. The trucks drive all over Massachusetts to dispose of the waste, depending on what type of truck and what we're disposing of, whether it's waste or recycling. Uh, so if we automate, we can reduce the number of trucks that come to town every day, thus reducing the amount of diesel fuel that they use and reducing our carbon footprint as a town operation. We could expand services, provide uh, other types of collection, if we want, we can enhance the opportunity of the compost site. We can maybe move some things around, maybe move the cargo collection down to the compost site, things like that. Um, <clears throat> one change, you know, those are all things that we, it, they take a lot of time to plan. Um, if we're going to change trucks, change how we're collecting solid waste and recycling, we'll need new trucks. Trucks right now, lead time of order a new truck. We we have new trucks on order ourselves with CPW. It's taken over a year to manufacture and be delivered. So any capital investment and change that we need to make. Uh, we'll need to notify waste management. They'll need to order the trucks. They need to staff appropriately. If we're going to automate and go to carts. They need time to manufacture the carts, time to educate the public, get people on board, get the support. You know, a lot of public outreach, that's a lot, you know, that's not something we can do by September and do a good job of doing it, right? So we want to make sure that um, with the changes in, or, you know, in the organization, um, kind of the re real reorg, restructure, get the right people in place to make sure we do it the right way. We'll obviously want to get buy-in, you know, maybe have a working group, something like that. Um, so that's why we don't want to make any um, <clears throat> quick, large changes, but we feel a two-year contract that's going into effect in September, you know, we that give us time to negotiate, have something in place long before the expiration of that contract and we know we're looking for it. So, and we do have price proposal. I think the, the and just, uh, you know, the price proposal two year, like the first year is like 11% increase. That, that includes some numbers in the memo. Uh, and the second year was 5% after that. With same service to the residential customer, one change we would see is that includes the installation of a uh, cardboard contractor or compactor at this facility to allow for um, reducing the number of dumpsters that we have to keep on site, which expands parking for uh, residents when they come to visit um, and just reduces kind of the overall, you know, increases the overall curb appeal of the property. So, happy to take any questions. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> Did you say you're definitely getting that cardboard compactor? That's included in the two year proposal for this year. Right. Those get filled up sometimes. <laughs> yes. And yes. not many people are flattening those boxes. Oh, yeah. So, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a headache. 
of your question. Yeah, a couple. Thanks, Sam. Great presentation. Yes, thank you. you answered a lot of my questions that I had jotted down here. So um, we've had waste management since 2004. Do we, during that period, have we rebid the contract or do we, we just continue to? Uh, methods. <laughs> so we don't know if we could get a better. I guess why don't we do that? So Massachusetts, yeah, so Massachusetts procurement law does not require the municipalities solicit for solid waste recycling. It's one of the few exempted yep. um, procurements, if you will. Uh, I think waste management provide excellent service since 2004. It's been no issues within the town. They know the town. Uh, the drivers are familiar with the routes. Very few, you know, complaints or issues arise when they do, we're able to pretty much resolve them. So, um, as far as you know, price competitiveness and soliciting, I think that you know after the two-year contract is up, you know for the subsequent contract, we definitely make it reach out to vendors and see what we can get for pricing. Also, maybe it's just a matter of terminology; you know, it's more informational. Um, the single stream recycling dumpsters, the cost is going down. Is that what is meant by single stream recycling? I was in a town prior to this one where everything went into one barrel and then paper waste product, and then they got separated out to the- um, So the diesel. single stream recycling dumpsters would be like the the, um, the paper and the cardboard. So it's still recyclable. Yeah. Those types of recycling. Okay. Um, I have one more question. I know where to find you. I remember. So, so Aaron, the, 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 the spreadsheet that you showed us here, this. The, the yellow column is for the first year of the two year contract. Right. Okay. I, have, and I, I was going to give you a hard time as to why the rates did increase because if, if we remember back to the water to mm -hmm. the water and sewer rates, you know, the, the feeling was that we would go st small steps, small steps, small steps. So the, the question is in any of your preliminary discussions about a contract more than two years out, do you have a sense there will be? A big change in the cost, or where where are your thoughts and discussions? So I think you know, I we did get a lot. We got a, a few different proposals for that. So I did get some long term cost proposals. Um, the longer term cost proposals had a lower upfront price increase, um, and it was more, I guess, level across the board. But that does require capital investment from waste management. So the the short term. Doesn't require them to purchase any of your trucks or us to right. purchase any any uh, um, any toters or, or barrels. Um, but the long term one would, and those costs basically be incorporated in that contract. I think what we're going to see is in the future, and one of the our biggest risks right now with the proposals that we receive, both the short term and long term, are the cost of fuel. Um, right. You know, fuel is you know our our contracted price. Is the one thing that can't change is the fuel cost, and they go back. You know. You know the language that's in there is we're going to look at the EPA, um, you know, average fuel cost over the previous quarter and adjust accordingly. And so that's our biggest, uh, you know, biggest risk that we see right now. I would anticipate that once we know, you know, two years out, a rate increase, or some some kind of rate increase. Yeah. Because I think we're, you know, our the intention for at least this first year of the contract is to uh, draw down that fund balance. And I would think after a full year, we're going to know which direction we want to go in, and if it's investing in barrels, we're gonna have to purchase those. You know, we had discussions, I mentioned earlier, we had a meeting with DEP this morning, Mass DEP, to discuss a grant that we're applying for, and we could discuss, you know, they do have a, uh, they call it a matching type of grant, where they will fund, I think it was $35 per barrel, if we wanna automate, um, a pay as you throw program and have um, smaller barrels available for trash and recycling. So, to offset some of those costs. And Jim, I'd also add, as Aaron mentioned, it's a it's a enterprise fund. Um, the capital investments, unlike the water and wastewater, you know, we don't have lots of infrastructure that needs you know repair replacement. And that's where with our increases for water sewer, we know these are happening. And for the solid waste recycling, we first started thinking we might go to bid and we might have a whole new program between staffing transitions and changes in, in town, we just didn't have that opportunity. So, you know, our interest is to sort of staff up, have the resources to put the time and energy in to understand the needs and environment. We did a survey, which was helpful. 
um, and then sort of start the promotion and then, you know, kind of figure out, then we can determine, all right, maybe this is time to go out to bid and see and compare, you know, who has what infrastructure based on what we decided we want. So the next two years there and said is by September, we'll already be thinking we're well into it. We're going to have to give enough notice for the next contract. That's what we're limiting to two years. Yeah. It's still a pretty narrow window. So when we get to a longer range contract, mm -hmm. will it be fairly level or will there be inflationary increases each year? Or is that something to be negotiated as, as you get closer? So they gave us a, the way they did this proposal for a five year contract. And it was, I, I, I don't know if I right in front of me, but the, the increases annually were between three and 5%. Okay. Built into that was also the fact for fuel, staying that fuel prices can change. And do they, they would amortize their capital expenses over that five That's year period? That's time. right. If they have different uh, equipment, they right. need to procure it yep. and pay for it. Right. And they want they to pay for it, it, but then they we pay back exactly. over the period of the contract. And they would look at it you know, over the, the okay. longer term to see how they recover those costs. Okay. Um, on a slightly different tent, if you will, the disposal per bag. I think of that as really small compared to the six month charge of $322 or whatever. Have you looked at, are you, will you look into that? Because for, we're not encouraging people to reduce their waste because the amount of extra waste that they throw into the system costs almost nothing in my mind. Correct. So that is a, a good point. In fact, we talked a little bit to the select board the other night, similar question came up. The issue is how to incentivize reduction and, yep. and, and volume. So historically, it was all about recycling. Well, everybody's caught up to that. We, had, we were innovative when it came to recycling. Now every community does similar things. The next issue is how to get the actual load or volume of other trash out. And that's how do you incentivize it? And, you know, this combination of you know, the um, um, organics, you know, we look at compost yeah. and, and we look at uh, the, the cost per bag, but yeah. we do incentivize it, but to some people, it means more than others. You know, you say it's a low cost, but you do pay more if you require more presently. Right. Per bag. I, I'm just thinking personally, we probably put our trash barrel out once every three weeks. We put our recycling out every week. Yeah. And so, you know, my, my cost for trash is pretty low except mm -hmm. for the fixed fee that's in the front exactly mm -hmm. so that'll all be that's all part as long of as it's part of the thought process it's definitely, definitely part of it yeah. and that's where the state has programs and uh, policies that are trying to encourage and incentivize that as well so when i'm hearing you talk about i was thinking of there's i'm sure i imagine from the survey that you did last year you've got some positive feedback you guys um generally interesting it's not so much positive as preferences and a lot of it you know trash is very personal and that was all, <laughs> it really is and oh. so that was part of what we received i'm not sure positive but more preferences of size of totes and convenience and frequency yeah. and things like that yeah see i would um i would argue that or propose that dbw has a cbw has a um some obligation to be thinking about um, innovatively about things that the, that the your customer base may not be thinking about, mm -hmm. like right. reducing their waste. They may selfishly, you know, not be pushing that personally. But what can we be doing as a town to be pushing people, encouraging people to recycle more or to reduce waste um, that they may not be? That's you know what I mean. That's our job. Become the subject matter experts. That's mm -hmm. we're in a process yeah. of hiring someone to do this. A lot of staff is, you know, taken over to deal with the day to day. But to be the subject matter expert, where's the industry going? And what does it mean to recycle plastics? You know, what's the misconception of that? We, we want facts so yeah. people can be informed and we're making the right decisions. Right. And what's the future? Where's exactly. it going? Yeah. Exactly. What's the best? What are truly the best practices? Um, I just have one quick question about the fund balance. I just want to understand this. Can you explain to me? Where that that comes from is that just because you take in more revenues than you're actually the program's costing you so you've got a surplus basically Correct. and so this year we're gonna instead of having any kind of increase you see right increase, here yeah it's increased so we've got you know over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in balance 
and basically consider it rate stabilization. But what we don't want to just keep adding to it, especially when we don't have a program that we can defend it with. Right. right. So right now, it's more of, especially now, it's helpful with what's going on with the economy. Sure. That we can provide not just increase for the sake of, but know that we still, you know, will retain. Uh, and with the number, you know, close to you know, four hundred thirteen thousand dollars by the end of this fiscal year, there may be some adjustments based on some fuel costs. costs and things like that. But you know, we'll have a couple hundred thousand dollars that's available. That's our goal. Okay. So, so yeah, Aaron, can you talk a little bit more about the revenue sources? I it, it's hard for me to read that. Yeah. Read, read that slide. Small. I I understand we've got the fee. But then what are the other kinds of revenues that do come in? Not the expenses, the revenues. So, so. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to, <laughs> that's a, that's trying to help a little cool. bit. So, collect, so, <laughs> so the collection, <laughs> yeah, so the collection that's that's signed up for the program. Okay. Uh, disposal fees are. The bags and stickers. Yeah, bag, right. Stickers for the barrels and, the, and, uh, and your bags. Uh, we charge the school, uh, town departments. Okay. To pick up, so we yep. charge the highway departments, right? So I'm charging one account to <laughs> the other. So yeah. for the dumpsters that we have at our, at our municipal properties, there's a cost associated with that. Um, school department uh, drop off day when people pay to drop off hazardous waste. I'm dropping off a of mattress or I'm dropping off whatever it may be. Um, business recycling program. So that's a that's an another drop off event for small businesses. We reach out to all the you know businesses downtown West Concord. The row area um, offer the drop off day, and then we, we collect fees for them to drop off electronics or whatever they might be dropping off. Um, compost bins and recycling bins that are sold. So, recycling bins, anybody that signs up for the curbside program, they are uh, offered, they're given two bins, but anybody that wants extra or breaks them or whatever it might be, we charge $7 for the replace. Okay, so so here's my question. I guess mm -hmm. approximately, and this I don't have the right calculation here. Sixty percent of residents use our use our solid waste mm -hmm. program. I'm going to guess that a hundred percent of our citizens may go to the former landfill mm -hmm. and drop stuff off. Mm -hmm. So there's there's somewhere between twenty and thirty to forty percent of us citizens of Concord that are getting a service that aren't paying for it, aren't paying anything. Because so we, we've dropped off the $5 mm -hmm. fee. Or whatever. Correct. That's a good is, is that a concern? I mean, are, is, are, are we spending it. more people time out there and, and equipment time? Yes. Uh, that, yes. I think that's something we should at least be thinking about for, for, for revenue sources. I agree. So a couple of years ago, so there used to be a fee associated with getting into that site. A few years ago, uh, the commission voted to eliminate the fee, right? So there's, there's no fee. There's just a sticker identifying. Um, during COVID, issues with the sticker has not been re-implemented. <laughs> not Highway and grounds has, budget has absorbed the cost of running the compost site. So every Wednesday, so tonight, I have an employee down there working from 3 to 6 p.m., right? Their salary is paid out of the highway general fund budget. Uh, Saturdays, the same thing. Um, so residents are, you know, being provided a service that is being 100% of residents pay property tax. Their property taxes are paid in the general fund. General fund funds that service. So the enterprise fund funds the curbside for solid waste and recycling services only. So it is truly a rate payer service versus the compost site that's funded by general fund. It's available to all residents, not okay. just those who sign up for curbside recycling. But we will be looking at I mean, that. That, 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 that. That's a good answer. But it's yeah. an opportunity, it, it, and there may be incentives to say be part of the curbside, be part of the, yeah. the, the, the co-op, yeah. and have uh, you know, discounted rates for access to, you know, okay. to incentivize sure. that. So I mean, Aaron also mentioned uh, that if we do get a cardboard compactor, Mm -hmm. Originally, it's going to be here, yeah. but ultimately, it might be out on Wall Street. That's going to result in an awful lot more traffic and mm -hmm. probably having to be open more frequently. <laughs> correct. That's correct. So, I mean, I know that it's a challenge here. It's going to be a challenge wherever it is. Right. However, it'll be more control, and that's really important. Oh. And uh, the control matters because it's open and yeah. accessible. 
and there isn't a, a security guard 24 7 yeah. here no, but presumably that's a, a pneumatic no. compactor that's diesel run or something like that electric oh, right so you got to plug in something right are there any, any plugs out on we'll, right. we'll, we'll be putting a service for it yeah <laughs> okay yeah it's a large yeah it's a large it's a large compactor so it okay. requires dedicated can, work, so. can i make a motion um about I, I, I don't know. Jeff, I think I probably remember the question I forgot before. Okay. And I was Alan, you were on a slide. I was at. Oh, okay. Yeah. Slide. Let me go back to. Uh, let me see if I can. Their their contract is with waste management is like one point three three six for the year for curbside pickup. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. And is that a flat fee? So if it's 3,500 residents or 3,700 residents, or does it, is that an average or an assumption based on a certain number of subscribers? That's a flat fee for them to come to town to run the routes. And then if additional subscribers pick up. We get on, more money. Yeah. And, but they're, yeah, and then there's a, I believe there was a separate price on the, the households per year. So the unit price per, per household is added in. So I wish I could provide a better answer to your question. I don't have that. I don't know. I don't know how much it fluctuates um, for a year based on the number of subscribers. Okay. Um, but I think based on, yeah, I don't. I don't have a better answer for that. I, I can. I can. I can follow up with you and let you know how that how much that fluctuates for a year. But it, but it stays flat for a year. Yeah. That's good. I was I was dealing with IT issues there, so I'm sorry I didn't even hear. But so I think the, the question is: so is it a flat rate? On the previous it, slide. So for the collection. So yeah. program expenses, one point three for waste management. Does that price fluctuate if more? Is that a flat fee for the year, or is that an assumption based on there are 3,500 subscribers? Yes. And if there's 3,700 subscribers, it, they're it, going to it, get a little We'll get more revenue, but yeah, that is an they assumption. They get more money. That's okay. right. Okay. okay. Yes. Which makes sense. Yes. Okay. So yeah. maybe just questions from the public. Sure. Before, sure. before, before we close it. Um, if no, the okay. commissioners are all set, I'll at this time entertain any questions from the public. Um, uh, or the public who might be what but and i will stop sharing and maybe we can see visiting people. us um are there any questions um from the from our virtual guests or from the present guests i don't see anyone raising their hand okay Anna, thank you very much um that said uh with the the commission's permission i will um propose a draft motion i think do um, you want to do it sure go ahead right, go ahead Oh, I, I, I like this. Did we close the hearing? Um, That's what you do. Okay. I'm going to do it right now. I did it along hereby make a motion to continue the curbside subscription rate. No, no, no. We can close the hearing first. I'm sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. I, I move that we, we close the solid waste and recycling subscription rate hearing. Second. Second. A roll call of commissioners Andrea Solomon. Aye. James Terry. Aye. Jeff Basser. Aye. David DeLong. Aye. Now. Going to draft motion. I, David DeLon, hereby make a motion to continue the curbside subscription rate of $322 annually for solid waste and recycling subscribers and for $162 annually for recycling only subscribers effective October 1st, 2022. The cost of weekly disposal tags will remain $1.80 each. The cost of six month barrel stickers will remain at $46.80. I second that motion. Thank you. We'll call the commissioners Andrew Solomon. Aye. James Terry. Aye. Jeff Vassar. Yes. David DeLong. Aye. Thanks, Aaron. That concludes the uh, solid waste and recycling hearing. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you for your great work. And, we're going to move on now to the next item on our agenda, which is a Magog Farm update provided by Director Cathcart and Superintendent Jeff Nowski. Yeah, so Jeff, come on up if you'd like. Um, this is, uh, in essence, um, an opportunity uh, to give. This is a, a relatively 
they call it a, a freshman class for Public Works Commission when it comes to NAGOC. So um, there is a long history that really goes back to you know, the 1800s, and uh, we won't go there. But um, from the past 30 years, um, Concord has had on its radar a need uh, to install a federally compliant filtration facility. Magog Pond is a surface water system, uh, does not have filtration, but 1989, EPA identified a need for all surface water uh, drinking water systems to put in uh, filtration facilities for water quality purposes, uh, public health and safety, primarily driven by kind of microorganisms. Um, there were uh, waiver opportunities because EPA recognized this was a big ask. It came out uh, and impacted a lot of uh, systems and communities, some as small as NAGOG and some as large as you know, MWRA and across the country. The waiver was granted to those systems that could demonstrate certain compliance with protecting the raw water quality of the reservoir. Was it a uh, a, a good quality to begin with? And was there protection systems in place to try and maintain that, that quality? Um, Concord went through the waiver process because the, the costs at the time were considered pretty significant. It included um, with a, a watershed protection program, the need to do enhanced disinfection. And you've heard us talk about ozone in the past. Ozone is a, is a disinfectant and that was what the town opted to do back in the mid 90s. At the same time, in the 90s, uh, there was recognition that this was a stopgap. And I think the plan was for a few years anyway. Well, it's now you know, 30 years later. Um, part of the stopgap was we need to put our house in order, which was one, look at a, um, a uh, amiable inner community any kind of land swap where we had some finite area to design and construct a treatment facility. There was an abutting parcel of open space of over 80 acres of sort of pristine, you know, kind of undeveloped un, um, land. Uh, the problem with that undeveloped land is Acton wanted to realize development of a high density residential community, and it was phased. It was, uh, and the developer, the, the owner, um, worked with the town of Concord because Concord had in the middle of that 80 acres land that it had acquired in, in the 30s it was designed for a filtration facility. So People knew even in the early 1900s, it was inevitable filtration was going to be required. So it was a um, concrete work with Acton, the developer required legislative act, to go uh, get approval to do this land swap. Concord then, um, once the land swap was uh, ratified, uh, the um, Town of Acton proceeded with the development of that 80 acres. First, it was a golf course, then it was a mixed golf course and condominium or uh, association. When that started, uh, that took some time. Uh, about 10 in 2013, Concord did a pilot assessment looking at what's the latest and greatest technology. Uh, we had plans. We were transparent with those plans to proceed with the design of a treatment facility at that on those properties the Concord owned, as well as the contiguous property that was swapped. And um, at that point, the Quail Ridge Condominium Association had formed. The developer who we'd worked cooperatively with in the town of Acton, um, there was a change of heart and interest and the abutters uh, and the, the, the new landowners and property owners took great uh, concern that Concord was gonna realize this treatment facility in their backyard. And this was the open 80 acres that had been there for a hundred years. And regrettably, it became a pretty contentious permitting process. Um, there were challenges, there was concerns on archeological impacts, on environmental impacts, on quality of life impacts, on security impacts. All these things came to a fore. 
there was a permit that was issued. It was not necessarily, um, uh, it was to, to realize the construction, the complete design and construction of that facility would have been a real challenge. It can be done. Um, but uh, as town went through this permitting uh, effort, which was pretty sizable and expensive, we then got um, challenged by the town of Littleton regarding water rights. And this was a big question because Concord was getting ready to invest. At the time, it was about, you know, when we first started this in 2013, probable cost us were somewhere around $10 million. Then we went through the permitting process. We then ended up in uh, a water rights uh, litigation. Um, ironically, even you know, people in Acton, when they were tracking the permitting, were in Concord explaining that you know, water rights, uh, what was this one comment made about you know, whiskeys for drinking, waters for fighting for. You know? So it was a real interest of, should Concord realize its long and planned investment in a federally compliant filtration facility. It was in an active water supply um, and it even served a part of Acton. So it's just interesting process. We dial forward to the litigation on water rights and it's important that was resolved. The town of Littleton had legitimate interests and concerns that they raised. Acton sort of partnered with Littleton because they were thinking they may have certain water rights that they wanted to be realized as well. So it forced a, a process that went through the land court and then the SJC. Uh, the result was significant and that it sort of established Concord's um, uh, principal or primary rights that we had uh, for a registered water supply from the 1980s. This was, we went from an 1884 local water rights you know, legislation and there were hundreds of these across the Commonwealth. And in the 80s, the Commonwealth said, we can't deal with all these individual localized legislative rights and authorities and they, they seem antiquated. So the Water Management Act was this holistic approach to looking at all the water resources of the Commonwealth. And the question became, and that's where at the time, it's ironic, I worked in Littleton at the time, <laughs> we submitted registration requests, basically entitlements to the water as of the use in the 1980s. So I submitted, I pulled together Littleton's request, which is ironic. Um, from that, Concord would, went through the same process, had its established registration rights, and then the question became, um, which is you know, sort of, what is the guiding document legally? And so we've resolved that issue. Concord has secured its rights. Littleton has secured some rights, depending on you know, where they need to go, but it gets complicated quickly on water balance and that sort of thing. I won't bore you with that. All these activities took years, time, and effort. The challenge is, and when we went through the permitting process in Act, and there was a question early on, why here? Why in our backyard? Well, Concord had a lot of momentum to get to that point, including negotiated land swaps, transparent planning, all this. And it was almost, well, of course, it's, this was what we've been planning. Have you looked at alternative sites? Well, there's nothing else around the watershed we can find. And at that point, the probable cost estimate, there was no feasible alternative. Dial the clock forward a few more years, our costs have escalated significantly. All these delays have resulted in tens of millions of dollars of cost of conference. We have literally had to look at the cost to say, we now establish water rights. And that was only last year. So we can proceed. This is a uh, an investment we can now make, we won't be stranded. And we looked at the costs and the constraints that were put in with the permit and the impacts and the, the challenges we would have to do anything different than what we originally planned. And right now there's consideration for emerging contaminants that we may need to accommodate. Our permit in Acton would make it very difficult to do those sorts of accommodations. So we are now in a process of, I call it reimagining the siting and acknowledging that we have a permit and we can proceed with the construction of a facility, 
on Concord land um, uh, that directly abuts the, the pond. But we've done an analysis, at least to look at sort of on a you know, 20,000 foot level, could we relocate that site? Look at the existing conditions and look at the long-term needs and interests of both you know, Concord as well as Acton, because we've talked with them and we have some understanding of some of their constraints that they've realized over the years, especially along that Route 2A corridor as far as economic growth and development. They have their own vision and Concord's supply and uh, infrastructure does not help them realize that. So we're, I take early in a process of the siting evaluation, but we're far along in the design of the treatment process. There hasn't been a notable change in the process. The only thing we're looking at is building footprint, materials, size, scale, parking, things that couldn't be accommodated on the, the small area with the constraints that were put up, imposed upon with the existing uh, approval from Acton. So that's a, that's a history. It's really just to give you uh, this group an overview that this has been long, deliberate, expensive, and a very important initiative. Act, uh, the Nagog Pond, when it's realized. Now, since I've been here for 25 years, Concord has had constraints in its ability to use Nagog because we don't have a filtration facility. And that curtailment has really impacted our ability to provide reliable quality water to the community. Um, we are now in a position to say long-term, Nagog can and should be return to become one of our primary sources of supply that's treated to the best degree you know, possible and feasible, um, and also allow us to, to better manage our water resources on a broader scale. So we're kind of looking at this as we are now preparing to uh, pull together a more detailed design of this facility, what it might look on this al alternative site. And uh, if that can be realized, go to town meeting in the fall. Once we realize and you know, cross all the T's, dot the I's as far as yes, this is doable, it's feasible, it makes sense long term. There'll certainly be some communication and coordination with Acton as we get there. But right now, for this commission, I wanted to give you a heads up because you know we just we don't meet regularly. We'll probably be having a working group over the summer. And it, you know, I'm hoping to have one or two members of the you know, commission involved, but it's not a commission initiative. This is a community initiative. So it will probably be broader than just public works to get a working group so we can, can figure out the long-term needs of, and, and, and solve that. This problem has been really nagging Concord for you know, 30 years. So that's the overview. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it short of the specifics general because there are chapters and chapters and chapters. And if you want to go back and look at the hearings and acting. They're all been recorded, they're all available. The comments are out there. And we have volumes of documents of back and forth and concerns that have been identified, addressed, and you know, why we have the permit and, and that sort of thing. But I did want the commission to be at least aware that there's a long history. You don't need to know that. What you really need to know is kind of moving forward, we're gonna be fairly aggressive this summer to try and figure out how do we realize Concord's, you know, compliant and drinking water facility. And I would also say we have qualified for the state revolving um, loan program, which would uh, afford at least a low interest loan and not to exceed 2%. That's important. You know, when you're talking about a facility that's gone from $10 million you know, in infrastructure to you know, up to 30, and that's sort of probable cost estimates and we need more detail. These delays, these challenges, they've cost Concord significantly. They're, they're, they're consequences. And regrettably, there are some people who say that's great, you know, that's Concord's problem, but it's been a challenge for Concord. And you know, what we need to do is get beyond that to the point of how do we work you know, collaboratively with other, you know, with Acton if there's a you know partnership, we've got to figure out what that is, what it means. But I think our interest right now is, you know, how do we take care of Concord's interests? So I want to give you that debrief and you can ask some questions and I might be 
a little cautious as far as how I answer because I don't have all the answers at this point. This is very kind of you know, preliminary as far as concept goes. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the commissioners? Yes. Yes, please check. Just put a more visual person. Sure. Yeah. So we have there's a they kind of they call it pond. Mm -hmm. We own a chunk of land in Acton where the original there's a land slot, but there was land there where filter plant filtration plant could have been placed. Mm -hmm. We still own that land. That's correct. Then there was another piece of land identified in Concord as an alternative site for the filtration plant. And now we're looking at a possible third site. No, okay. So the original plan in it was this goes back to 1930. Yeah. We have um, back in the 30s, you didn't have a power supplies and infrastructure to get, yeah. you know, sort of a, a facility. So the engineers used gravity. Right. And that's why Concord had both Sandy Pond and Lincoln, Nagog, um, and Acton Littleton to utilize gravity that would bring it from the a gatehouse, mm -hmm. which is maintained in coarse screen. That's all the gatehouse is, mm -hmm. or you know, debris. Then whether it's a quarter mile downstream and hydraulically downstream, a parcel of land that was carved out for mm -hmm. future filtration to allow gravity right. flow through some sort of sand filtration or something in the 30s. That was up in Acton. That was in the middle of what is now known as Quail Ridge yep. Condominium Association. Mm -hmm. When the developer, when it was undeveloped, realized I'm going to have difficulty developing, and Acton's going to have difficulty realizing taxes from this. Well, if Concord's going to this facility right in the middle, it significantly devalues this this property and our potential growth. So that was why it was an agreeable. Well, you know what? We have power supply. We can, we don't have to rely on gravity. We will do a land swap. So if we'll take the equal area of land, we'll give that to this private entity so they can realize the full development potential. And we'll uh, put this contiguous to the town's land act, uh, Concord's land. And that land swap required legislative authority to do. And it was very transparent, it required communication from senior leadership from both communities, very agreeable. And ironically said, everything up until, you know, we even worked with a developer on, they blasted, they clear cut, they did all this work around our, into, our uh, infrastructure okay. and we monitored it, but we did nothing other than try to be cooperative and helpful with the idea that you'll finish and we're gonna, we still need to get our ducks in a row and the financing to put our filtration plant in. So that was, that was the history before recently. And now, we're saying with the constraints that were imposed on the permit, with the cost of what it might take to realize it at that location and the emerging contaminants, PFAS specifically, mm -hmm. it's been something that wasn't on the radar that long. We realized we need to reimagine and evaluate the site. And because of that, we've looked at property in Concord. Okay. What's important is whatever the water is from the pond to the treatment facility is untreated. Right. Once it goes to the treatment facility, then it can be put into the distribution system for use. So the land that we currently own, where at one point the filtration plant yeah. may have been placed. That's right. Would we want to keep that because it serves as somewhat of a natural buffer to the pond? Well, we, we so we will continue to protect the watershed. That was another irony of okay. this. Concord has over 60 acres of protected space. Yeah. What makes Nagog Pond the precious resource is Concord's protection over 100 years. Okay. So, so it's our, what hasn't been developed is primarily Concord's land. Everything else has been developed to the brim. Yeah. And it, that's the irony. And when we want to do a little, develop you know, the treatment facility the outcry of what we we're going to do to deforest that area was just it was it was remarkable given what had happened to jason got it, got it. so it's in our best interest to keep that land it's yeah it's still part of the part of the, the assets and, and yeah. protection of that resource which you know and there was also questions and challenges as far as you know we we're going to you know our our impacts can be detrimental to the resource and we kept making yeah. the case it's our drinking water supply. Yeah. Nobody wants to protect this resource more than Concord. 
and we've done it for 100 years and we'll continue to do it. That's our interest. So, so it was really just, this is to give you a sense of a little background yeah. and mm -hmm. sort of we have a team, you know, good engineers on board. You know, Jeff is sort of new to our team. He'll be overseeing the, the design uh, of this you know, facility. Um, and the, the time table, the table is tight. You know, we're going to work diligently over the summer. Um, whether we need to reconvene one of our meetings for, you know, related to NAGOG, I don't know. But I think this working group is more, you know, sort of designed to, because this is broad interest for Concord, you know, we're looking for planning, select board, um, public works commission to kind of help as we navigate through these, uh, some, some pretty significant questions for the town. And the outcome from the working group is what? Yeah. Well, imagine um, a successful town meeting, a uh, special town meeting in the fall with any coordination and intercommunity coordination, you know, with Acton as, uh, it, you know, the project will have impacts. There's going to be opportunities. And I think if we do this properly, both communities will realize something beneficial out of this. I mean, Acton has been forwarded with its long range planning, you know, for economic growth development. And you know this could be something that they could now use as an incentive to do something that they needed to do for years. But you know this is the, the kind of discussion we have to have with with that. And okay. Any other questions from the commissioners? No. Um, can I invite the public to please yeah to sure. raise questions? Yeah. Any questions from the public present here or um, online? Anna, are you seeing Anna, can you track, see if there's any hands risen? I don't see anyone raising their hand. Okay. Um, if, uh, if that's the case, then I think we're complete. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. No, no, I didn't know. Yes. We're complete with this topic. That's right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Alan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for. Sure. <laughs> Jeff will be busy this time. Yeah, he'll be busy. Right? The <laughs> real work is just getting to you today. So I just think sorry about your summer. Um, <laughs> the uh, director's report, I don't know how long that's going to go. I invite you to provide the director's report. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me go back to the shared screen. Okay, the technology today was challenging. All right, here we go. I think we got, uh, all right. Uh, I will say, um, I'm, I'm just excusing myself while this is going on. That's okay. Yeah. okay. All right. The last two pages of the agenda. All right. So we are, this is a photograph. Uh, we, we did celebrate public works week, uh, just a couple weeks ago. And we had a, um, sort of a, a nice get together with the, uh, you know, all the crew, I'd like to say this is everybody, you know, we got who was available at the time, but this is primarily, you know, the public works team. And so we've got our engineers, we've got our um, highway grounds group, we've got our water sewer group, all represented um, cemetery, uh, and parks and trees. And uh, it's just one opportunity to sort of say thank you to the team. And, uh, and basically just, you know, it's a, uh, an honor to be kind of serving with these people. Um, Steve Duker, you want to, you're here, you can come up and just real quick, we're just going to go through and, uh, you know, you've, you've been given the director's report. Again, the, the rules of engagement are you read it, you have questions, feel free to ask. Us. Steve will do some of the highlights of things you think you should be aware of anyway. So, go ahead, Steve. So, yeah, yeah. Steve Duker, town engineer. Um, this first slide shows uh, work over in Barrett's as part of our roads program. Uh, it shows a uh, ticker where we were, we had milled sections of the street and shimmed it in preparation for the application of asphalt rubber chip seeding, which is going to be coming in the next several weeks. So Steve, have parts of it been actually finished? Because there, there, are, there are spots that are very smooth, and then there are spots that are Oh, sure. oh, okay. If you like it that way, you can leave it, but no, <laughs> we are going to be coming back for the aspect. Every, every the whole thing. Wow. Yes. Yeah, that road is tremendously much easier to drive. Yeah, it's important to know, and this is where Steve and the engineers, it's expensive to do different treatments. And so what you're seeing is sort of a, 
a combination of treatments to get it to the point where what people care about is what's the surface like at the end of the day. Steve and his team need to work about, you know, worry about the structure and the foundation and things that go deeper than just what you see. So, so you might remember the asphalt rubber chip seal is really a, a preservation type treatment, right. but you want to make sure the bad spots will repair and that's what we have. Yes, to the right. In fact, you've done the same thing on College Road and a little bit on a nurse deck. Right. So, yeah, we are. So, a lot of work is going on on Hubbard oh, Street yes. from last year. So, uh, we started by reclaiming the pavement and the, the base under the pavement. And that's what the product you see in there. That's a, so we, we graded it. And then we, I think the next slide shows where we, we did a binder asphalt layer. Um, and then the curbing followed. So the curbing is all done. Mm -hmm. And currently they're doing the handicap ramps for the sidewalks. And when those are done over the next couple of days, the sidewalk preparation will start and we'll coordinate work with the uh, utilities, uh, the light plant, and as well as Comcast have um, these boxes that we need to adjust and they're ready. So the finish line is, uh, is, is in sight and hopefully by the summer we have that done. But I, I need to draw your attention. Um, I wrote it in the report and I thought I would have a picture to show. We did have a neighborhood meeting um, some weeks ago, primarily to talk about complete streets. Um, because as you remember, this project is funded partially by Complete Streets Grant. And uh, Complete Streets is about you know, all modes of transportation, pedestrians and bicycles and so on. And so we, we wanted to talk about how we're going to implement accommodations for bicycles with a with neighborhood. And uh, so, it involves, so we can't put dedicated bikers, we just don't have it the right way. Um, so it's about sharing the road, um, you know, cars and bicycles, uh, which involve um, putting in these bike symbols, we call them shadows, along you know, the way, as well as putting in some, some lines, some striping lines uh, to now really slow the traffic down. And I would have to say, regrettably, um, the, the neighborhood doesn't want to see any kind of additional pavement markings than there were before the work started. So we are looking, we are looking at it more closely, um, especially with what are our, our obligations to receiving these grants, the grant monies. You know, that's one thing. And secondly, um, truly envisioned concrete and other types of approaches, we did adopt a complete streets policy some years ago, and um, they encourage, you know safer use of the, the travel way. And uh, how do we get that with this project? I think we, we owe ourselves uh, those answers. So it's really in that way. Yeah, there's some complexities here that's interesting and, and challenging. And this is a project that this staff inherited. You know, the, the positive news is, you know, this grant was awarded uh, based on an application that I don't think we were even around for the application. So what happens and we, we lessons learned on this complete streets is something which the town has kind of uh, adopted the state has blessed our our policy um it's consistent with a lot of the envision concrete interests which is good it's you know bimodal transportation and accommodations of pedestrians and cyclists and reducing speeds all these things the challenge is everybody loves the concept but when it gets close to home, it gets very, it's like they're trapped. All of a sudden, well, wait a minute. We love this concept, but not here. This is a different kind of neighborhood. Well, we need to make sure and moving forward that if we're going to um, move forward with state funded you know, uh, programs, that the neighborhood is aware of all, everything, not just the pieces they like. Right. And regrettably, we weren't here to set the table. So we have to be respectful of, we imagine the concepts were shared. We don't know if they were heard, but we don't have that firsthand understanding. And so the challenges with engineering, they need to do things based on design standards and safety. And each 
neighborhood may have an opinion that, well, we kind of like, you know, there may be shades of gray. We don't know how much flexibility we have, but we can't go right out of the box saying, all right, no markings because you don't want it. Because the complete streets need to be for the entire community. It's not just for the neighborhood. And it's integrating these connectivity from one part of town to another. So we're going to be working with our complete street uh, priority list to better understand what is it that we've identified, how does it actually integrate, and how do we identify and prioritize what projects get funded. And this is something staff doesn't do. The good news is, and we're sort of getting familiar now with the staff involved with the traffic management group, engineering, highway grounds, police, they do review requests from the town on signage, on some safety issues, on markings, on brush, to say this is within our authority, within our budget, within our you know, operating budgets, we can do something and respond. But if it elevates to, well, this is a, actually a project, and now it has to compete with, it's got to go into the bin. And we're probably looking at working with the Transportation Advisory Committee, which was kind of a recently formed the last couple of years, it's, it's actually a great opportunity to transition from a kind of routine, you know, maintenance or, you know, uh, work that staff can do to, this is bigger than that. It may not seem like it to the, the interested party, but it may be we've received that request. We know the Sudbury Road crosswalk between Stowe Street and the library is there's an interest it's in our list so we can tell you it's there the next question is how does it get prioritized or, or positioned for grant money or a, pro, a town project that's going to get funded and maybe that's where tech can get involved public works commission historically might have been in that position it's a difficult position to be in but really public works is looking at design standards and sort of those you know kind of projects and engineering has control of, but when it gets to the transportation, complete street issues, those are broader. There's various stakeholders have a voice and need to be heard. And so that's where TAC comes in. So I think this is an opportunity, but this is actually a, a real world lesson of, we gotta be careful as far as what the neighborhoods understand, if we're gonna proceed with, what does it mean? You know, it's, you, know, you can't just, you know, order the, the prime rib and not have the vegetables too, you know, whatever it is, but we're working on that, you know, and I think we'll, you know, this is going to be a challenge because the neighborhood is looking at engineering, you oh, know, you can't do this. Well, we're not sure we, what flexibility we have. So we're going to be kind of looking, and if this gets to the point where um, there's some parking issues that would need to be identified, parking needs to be approved, reviewed and approved by the select board, you know, so there's there's various bins and reviews, but it's just important. And I think you know, lesson learned from this team, you know, that moving forward, I think this is all right, good to know. Make sure that the neighborhood is aware of what it's signed up for, what the town has signed it up for. Okay. Was your meeting just with the neighborhood right. then? Right. Like TAC wasn't there as well. Okay. That's right. And they were they signed it up for. Um and then it, one of the things you look at is if you're considering putting signs or, or markings on the street that are for safety issues, shouldn't that override everything? It should, but it's not. Not, not in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's that's always the challenge. Yeah. So it's aesthetics versus safety. We always, everybody, you have to say safety first and we we don't have a choice. If there's some flexibility, if there's some things that can be done creatively, you know, I think it's going to be a, a little bit of can you customize these these concepts? And I'm talking to an engineer. I'm a geologist. So I'm all about customizing it. Steve has to be kind of rigid because someone has to like say this is going to hold up if there's an incident. Yeah. Um, I think you kind of suggested this, or maybe came out outright and said it, but I'm going to say it in different words, is I think as a town, we need a you know, more comprehensive policy on, you talked about Shiro's, 
you know, and then we'll share a little bit on their markings on the streets and their signage you can use. But as we all know, all our streets are shared with bicyclists. They're all over the place. Mm -hmm. So why mark this one when none of them are marked? But if we're going to mark this one, why don't we mark all of them? And I think that's a bigger policy issue that we need to tackle as a town. I personally, I mean, I don't live there, but I don't think it's going to have, it would make a difference on the street. You know, and sheriffs would question. make a difference on a highly traveled, bu busy street where you're warning more motorists look out for a bicyclist. And that is the, the challenge right now with the complete streets is how does this relate? I, I, I look at it as a quilt. This is a patch. Mm -hmm. We're starting with, you know, well, what does the quilt look like? Well, we don't know. But putting all this energy and design in this, and well, it doesn't fit this neighborhood. If it fit within a fabric and a whole quilt and people could look at it and say, right. oh, I see, then that helps explain what we're doing and why. We don't have that yet. Yeah. I'm so, I'm nothing it, against anybody. I'm surprised no, we don't, being well, such a bicycle-friendly community. That's, that is the opportunity. And that's why TAC is... It's this, is this really more of a TAC? I would suggest that they'd be plugged in because they're going to be looking at transportation and, right. you know, and I think there's some obvious gaps in understanding and information right now that we have to recognize and acknowledge that they exist. You know, I think what's important is putting a spotlight on the fact that what does the town want to realize and how quickly, and I know the select board has already sort of volunteered a willingness to try and fund some third party support to help us figure this out. And that's really important. And I think there's three pieces. What is it? What's our priority list look like and why? Mm -hmm. What kind of criteria we look at when new interests are identified? How do we screen that? Have a firm that is aware of grant opportunities before they hit? Mm -hmm. I mentioned the other night the select board, it's almost too late when you get an announcement. The companies in the biz know this is coming and they've helped train the the RFP, so they know what it's supposed to be. And if they're familiar with Concord's interests, they'll position us so that we can then get the hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars of investment and also have the resources and staff that could do some of the design because to qualify, the clock starts ticking. And you say to maybe TAC, hit these three projects, see what you can do for us. And then have a team who can actually do it and this isn't something for engineering to sort of create in, you know, by the way, you got two months. This would be, if we can do this right, we think that third party support can really help Concord. And we also know Concord needs transportation um, uh, subject matter expert mm -hmm. in Concord. And I know the town manager is trying to figure out how and where that fits. There's a position that's been sort of funded. Mm -hmm. You know, the question is, is it, it's a transportation something, mm -hmm. it's a transportation planner, it's a transportation engineer, is it something in between? That to be determined. We don't have a bicycle accommodation master plan yet for the town that anybody's aware of. No, we're, we don't have a um, sidewalk master plan that we're aware of. And these are the sorts of things that we need to be integrated with planning to kind of help inform. You know, planning knows about the parks and the trails and all those sorts of things. So if we do this right, we do have the opportunity. And, you know, Steve, I, I, I give Steve credit. He brings to Concord some transportation knowledge, which is not always the case with town engineers. Mm -hmm. But that knowledge is going to be helped, at least help public work so we don't end up over committing or not being involved where we need to be. That's really our interest is how do we engage properly? Because you don't want someone volunteering to do something you know i don't want a doctor who's not a doctor you know doing surgery on me you know you got to be an md so, so all right sorry that was a little side but important those are kind of meaty interest we take the vegetables remember that is there any more this is our emergency um project that we completed but it's never 100 percent. there's always that 0.1 percent that never gets done right so we had some erosion the contractor returned and repaired it hopefully it takes the grass takes and it's good for the for, from here on what you see there is that that uh, great system that's uh an effort to keep the beavers out 
It's a That's wonderful working. system. That's good. Is that working? So far. So far. Yeah. Is it is it a is that on the intake side or the out the side? The okay, yeah. good. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I hope we didn't put it <laughs> <Hopefully, laughs> no, 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 This was the beginning of the problem last yeah. time right. about this. Right. Yeah. All right. Here? Still with us? Yeah. Come on up. Oh, don't uh, so this is um, so last month, very busy month. Uh, we're in spring maintenance mode, um, kind of before, during, after. Uh, some road repairs, um, common repairs you see after the winter time. A lot of patching work needs to be done. Uh, we receive, you know, notifications from residents. We're out inspecting roads ourselves. Uh, we have a work order management system. We track all the all the patching we do. Um, the crews are out. You know, almost daily, you know, kind of just depending on the weather and what we have um, for staff and, and other priorities, but we have to do a significant amount of patching. Um, so this is the cruise with some smaller patch work on uh, uh, a couple of roads in town. Tree planting program, full, full swing last month, uh, completed the spring planting program, a number of trees planted throughout town. Uh, this is Domino Drive. Uh, we planted a, a number of trees along Domino Drive, you kind of see. Um, before, photo on the left, um, ball and bear lap uh, tree being planted, um, coming a wire cage, cut off a wire cage, uh, cut up in the bear lap, <coughs> um, kind of excavate, dig out the hole, plant the tree. Um, see a photo on the right hand side, uh, newly planted tree. Uh, there's about five or six trees right on Domino Drive and Conant right there in that corner area. You're talking about the volume of trees you're doing is worth. Oh sense. yeah, so I mean, this fiscal year along between fall and spring plantings, well over 100. I think we did between uh, I think just over 80 uh, this season. So um, we plant as many as we can. Uh, not only are we planting, it was a lot of time and effort to go into the planting process, going out, looking at the site, meeting with the residents, coordinating nursery stock, cleaning delivery, installing the tree, um, and then post installation with the maintenance inspection of the tree. So maintenance is. Um, you know, watering, we do weekly watering of the tree, especially, you know, now if you know, I haven't had much rain. Um, we've been having to water trees. It takes a couple of staff, a couple of days to water the trees. So and that goes on for a couple of years. Yeah, year to year and a half, depending on the health and condition of the tree. And you know, we're out when they're watering, they're inspecting the tree, making sure it survived the <clears> transition from the nursery to being stored to being planted. And it's pretty stressful on trees. So and staff. Yeah. And staff. Uh, there was the drop off event, um, no swap off. Uh, this is a photo of some of the, the resident volunteers. Is, uh, you know, couldn't do the event without the volunteers. Um, just the sheer volume of activity and work that's, that's being done in coordination is needed. Um, so, uh, for, uh, some of the volunteers are kind of acknowledged here on this photo. Um, and inside the this garage bay, uh, 133 building. This this becomes part of the campus gets taken over by this drop off event and it's just it's all consuming. You know, we literally move equipment off the site temporarily, put, you know, if you've been there, the containers around the campus. Um, and you said one of one of my concerns and, and we're continuing to work on the um, security of the site is regrettably people come twice a year and they confuse this site for a almost a transfer station because that's when they're here and regrettably some people continue to sort of bring materials by you know randomly over the year and that's been one of the reasons we need to kind of better you know, control the campus um do they just drop them off anywhere it's or it's, it's, it's overnight it's, illegal yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so it's one of those reasons why we we need better security on campus Um, uh, some more photos of the drop off day event. Yeah, the trailers, and you know, it's uh, I think we had what was it, eight close to 800 visits. And the other thing worth noting is these visits are much better orchestrated because they're scheduled now. So people come, it used to be come when you could, <laughs> and lines and traffic impact and all sorts of things were just you know really kind of chaotic. And it was another safety issue because cars are coming and going and leaving everywhere. But the control is is much more sane, I think, for everybody involved. So that was actually a pretty significant improvement into the, the program. 
Here you got your some more photos, uh, some staff photos there, um, some volunteers as well. Bagging up uh, top photos of styrofoam recycler. So you can pick up the bag and pre-stuff -pre your the bag full of styrofoam before you show up and, and drop it off for a fee. So. All right. So I, Thank you, Aaron. Any other questions for Aaron on this records report? Uh, okay. All right, Jeff, we'll come up. So we'd be over by 5 30, and we're pretty close. Yeah, we're not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't jinx us. Chuck Morosky, our sewer superintendent. On this slide, we're showing the cover page for the 2021 annual water quality report. Uh, in this year's report, there were no violations, no exceedances. In the 2020 report, we did have one violation for bromate, which was from, I believe, the Benegog pond source from bromide, which is in the same chemical family as chlorine and chloride. Oxidized, it formed bromate. Um, we did not utilize the Nagog source in 2021. So that was not even in the picture for us. We will have printed copies of the annual report available at the townhouse, both libraries at Crosby's. It'll be at 133 Public Works, and we'll have copies here at Division of Planning and Land Management. And then if anyone were to request a copy, we would mail it out to uh, a customer or a constituent. And we'll also be sending out notice cards uh, to the water customers indicating that the annual report is available. Yeah, it'll be on their, um, in their bills. We just talked about beavers for a drainage culvert. Well, this is a trail cam photograph of a beaver. Looks like it has a birch tree branch across the uh, spillway for Nagog. <laughs> So Alan mentioned before, we were operating Magog under a surface water treatment rule filtration waiver. Warm-blooded mammals, there's a fecal coliform risk there, there's a, a Giardia, Lamblia, and possibly Cryptosperdia as a source with beavers. So we had to, uh, we first noticed evidence of beaver activity on April 7th, and we've been pursuing and have received uh, off-season trapping for beavers. We've attained that from MassDEP, we've obtained it from Acton, and we're still waiting on hearing from Littleton Health Department. But so far we have trapped one juvenile beaver. Where there's a place where it's appropriate to leave them off if they have to move trap them? That's a good question. I'm not fully versed on the program. I think it is humane. I don't think they're being uh, euthanized, if that's the question. No, no, I guess are they being transferred to another location? I'm not sure, but I can okay. go back to you on that if you like. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure the, the, the final outcome of these beavers, quite honestly. I, 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 okay. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> the next slide is highlighting a water main extension that the uh, commission approved back in April for Pond Street it was a relatively short extension. Uh, what we're looking at in the uh, inset in the uh, larger photograph are two different shots of the hydrant, newly installed hydrant on the north end of the project and the um, right under water and sewer is the home that's um, it was the driving force behind getting this water main extension it's number 49 pond street 49 pond street didn't have frontage on the water main so that facilitated the um, proponent to request a extension and they came before the commission for that so the the installation went very well it went very quickly uh, the water main was pressure tested disinfected and uh, it's being flat out here in preparation for being put online and it was put online at the beginning of this week. This next slide is a state map showing the Massachusetts drought status as of April 1st. As you can see, Southeast Massachusetts and the islands, Mathis Vineyard and Nantucket are both in a level one mild drought, but Northeast Massachusetts still is in level zero normal. 
since we went into the high demand season, uh, we did institute the seasonal water conservation advisory. So if, if the drought status were to elevate, that might trigger us to implement the lawn watering restriction, which is our yellow code on our seasonal water demand management plan. And that was all I had. Uh, any questions from the commission? Alan, um, or Jeff, in the past, we have authorized the chair to be able to uh, make, make such a uh, declaration without, you know, the next time the commission meets, we would authorize that. Order. That's correct. Is, I, that some, that's, is that something that automatically now happens? Yes. Or do we have to do it every year? No, it's a policy that the commission has established. Okay. And, and it's basically, um, there may need almost real time or very quick um, decision to impose a, uh, whether it's a mandatory one day a week it, or even an emergency. You know, we found it was just always difficult in the past to get the commission together, summertime. So um, in essence, uh, I would contact uh, the chair. They work on behalf of the commission to make this declaration. And then the following meeting, we would sort of provide an update. So that is- okay, has so, been so it is automatic. Okay, yeah. thank you. Correct, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. That was it, thank you. All right, so I think is that the end of the I director? think that's the end of the director's report. So okay. we're now entertaining the commission. commission. Any comments? Um, Alan, could I get Aaron's slides? To, I mean, the slides that have the revenue and the sure. and the expense and the one that showed them what the last three. I just said the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And definitely. I, 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 that. I, I'm going to recommend that you send it to all the commissioners. We'll do that. Because I think that there was a valuable information that wasn't in our packet. Okay. No. Um, when, when you were talking about the, the streets, mm -hmm. sometime can we have a discussion about speed bumps? Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily the bumps, but the, the, the ones that are more elongated and right, so what, whether, and you know, what, what Concord would have to do differently to have something like that available. Mm -hmm. So I think just to put it on the yep. future. Steve's got that mm -hmm. on his radar and we'll make sure we include that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Discussion. Discussion. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> That's it. Those are my points. Thanks. No. Any public comments? I have one comment. Um, my name is Mary Hartman and I live at 16 Concord Green. I'm also on the select board speaking for myself. Um, last night, there was a, large, a very well attended public forum on housing in Concord. And it was attended by people who are mostly interested in affordable housing, but housing in general in Concord and what do we do about it and how do we want my more diverse housing stock. And several times it came up that wastewater management was a barrier. So I just wanted you to be aware that it seems like more and more people are becoming interested in, in that from our, our affordable housing or diverse housing stock perspective. Mm -hmm. so. Mary, was it in areas that have sewers or is it in areas that would be on septic systems? They didn't get that. They okay. didn't, they didn't, it was just, what are the barriers to bringing in more housing stock or denser housing and people would bring up wastewater? Okay. So mm -hmm. yep. it, good. Yeah. they didn't get that far. Okay. okay. Any other public comments? Yeah. Um, and any public comments you can see? Any hands raised or? No, I do not see any. Okay. I move we adjourn. A second. So we'll take a roll call. I'm James Hayes. Aye. Is that yes. I'm Aye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.